All was once a great nation, a land of wealth, beauty and plenty. Over the centuries, it has endured the abandonment of gods, the rise and fall of kings and queens, even the decimation of an ancient curse and the rule of an elder dragon. Though now only a shadow of its former days, hope still lingers for the resurrection of all. There is a hint of rebirth cradled in the greenery that has sprung up between the coral and crumbling stone. It was in awe, sometime before 786 BE, that the six human gods first set foot on Tyria. Drawn to the magic of the Artesian waters, they arrived from the mists and made all their home. The gods built a great city above the spring, and lived there in Ara until their exodus from Tyria. In 205 BE, humans came to Ur. Led by King Doric, they created an empire that spanned the northern continent. Eventually this nation split into three, forming the peoples that would go on to found the nations of Kryta, Ascalon and Ur. The humans revered their gods, and sought to build great temples and statues in their honour. Across Ur, even in its ruined state, the likenesses of the gods can be seen, but the history of these statues is steeped in sorrow. Once living amongst their beloved humans, the gods soon realised that their presence was causing them harm. Gazing upon the gods drove many humans to blindness, such was the glory of their form. The gods chose one human, a man named Malkor, to sculpt statues so that their faces could be known by humankind. As Malkor completed each statue, the god he represented retreated into Ara and closed themselves off from the world and with each statue, the toll on Malkor's eyesight progressed. He became fearful, acutely aware that soon his most beloved goddess Duena must too disappear from him forever. After finishing his monumental task, Malkor's heart and mind fell under his grief. He was faced with the knowledge that he would never see Duena again, and spent his last days in her temple on the northern coast of Ur. Tormented and heartbroken, his final act was to cast himself from the cliffside into the water below. In ruined ore, his actions are immortalised in Malkor's Leap, an area where Duena's temple still stands, and the remains of his sunken workshop still sit beneath the sea. The god's time in ore ended with the Exodus, leaving humankind to fend for themselves. In the years that followed, Or maintained its standing in the world, becoming a prolific and wealthy trading nation, ruled by a succession of kings and queens. But the days of prosperity waned. Like much of Tyria, Or fell victim to the ravages of war. Around 1071 AE, Or was ruled by King Reza. He was a peace-loving, diplomatic king, who participated in conflict with great reluctance. He was as devoted to the gods as his ancestors, and encouraged his people to follow the arts and continue to build their nation. At the time of his ruling, humankind was locked in a great battle called the Guild Wars. Feuding over possession of fragments of the bloodstone, guilds fought each other and slaughtered in their greed. King Reza, desperate to end the fighting, sent Or's armies into battle, leaving his kingdom vulnerable and weak. In their absence, another force sought entry into Or. The Char, invading from their homelands in Ascalon, rushed forth in droves to overtake the human kingdom. Seeking to break the might of humankind and reclaim their land, the Flame Legion shamans took advantage of the chaos in the north wreaked by the Searing to begin their attacks. King Reza was unprepared and undefended. His advisor, Vizier Kilbron, took matters into his own hands. Kilbron had entered the warded vault deep within the catacombs of Arar and brought the lost scrolls to his tower. These scrolls held immeasurable power, and as he spoke from them, Kilbron doomed his entire kingdom. Or was shattered and plunged deep beneath the waves of the Bay of Sirens, now known as the Sea of Sorrows. In the wake of the Cataclysm, the only things left on the ruins of Or were undead, and Kilbron's twisted body now cursed to walk the land as a lich. Gone were the golden archways, the towering temples, the green fields and farmland, and in its place was silt, sand and brine. Or continued for a time, a magnet for pirates seeking to pillage its treasures. Then in 1219 AE, Or drew the attention of something far more sinister than the Wrath of the Char. The slumbering elder dragon of death and shadow, Zaitan, awoke. As he rose from the depths under the peninsula, he drove any ships that sailed above him high into the air, and speared them on the rocks and spires of risen Or. 
the wave created by his awakening rushed across Tyria as a great tsunami, flooding much of the coast and even submerging entire islands. Zaitan moved to Arar, and once enthroned in his new kingdom, he set about extending his influence. His tendrils of corruption began by reanimating the dead. Orr's doomed people became the foot soldiers and fodder of the Elder Dragon's War. For his commanders and most powerful servants, he chose royalty, plundering the tombs for corpses that he moulded into monstrosities. For all of them, their return to Tyria was wrought with suffering under the dragon's tyranny. Oblivious to the state of decay around them, they were trapped as echoes of the glory days of Orr. Even in modern Tyria they remain, stalking the shores and striking out against anything that gets too close. Zaitan also sought to control Orr via the relics left behind by the gods. He set about corrupting the statues that littered the broken land, subverting the blessings they once bestowed to auras of sickness and decay. Each god's temple, from Balthasar to Duena, Grenth to Lissa and Melandru, fell prey to dragon magic. These statues were key to Zaitan maintaining his hold on the peninsula, and as such were one of the key areas the Pact sought to reclaim. The Pact was founded in 1325 AE by the Silvari firstborn Traherne. Uniting the three orders of Tyria, the Order of Whispers, the Vigil and the Priory, he aimed to create a force that could counter the threat of Zaitan in the south. As his wild hunt, a quest bestowed upon him in his Dream of Dreams, Traherne was compelled to study Orr. Eventually, with the aid of the spirit of the long-dead Reza, he was led to the Artesian waters themselves, there to enact a spell that was to cleanse the corruption from Orr. The spell freed Zaitan's most powerful lieutenants, opening the way for soldiers to march on Arar and to the dragon himself. Once the battle with Zaitan was won, the pact rejoiced. No longer would the Elder Dragon pollute the land. They were safe in the knowledge that dragon corruption could be lifted, both from the former minions of the dragon and the very ground itself. Leaves sprung up from sandy soil, vines clambered up the coral cliff sides, and flowers bloomed in the bright light and clean air. Here in modern Orr, on the shores of Siren's Landing, these rejuvenated landscapes are at their best. The architecture here consists of vast reliquaries, each one dedicated to containing the holy relics of the human gods. Between, around and beneath each flows magic in the form of ley lines. Scholars aim to restore the reliquaries, believing the unhindered flow of ley magic will speed up the cleansing of all. Magic, plundered from the organs of creatures that feast on these ley lines, has been proven to purify the corpses of the risen that walk these hills. Hopefully with the proper balance restored, this practice can be applied on a much wider scale. Silvari are particularly invested in helping the Risen. Like these walking corpses, they too experience living under the yoke of an elder dragon. Similar to Zaitan, Mordremoth moulded his minions into monsters and bent them to his will. Hoping to use magic contained in the very same waters that flow from the source of ore, scholars such as Anka capture and study Risen in Siren's Landing and Dagonet, another firstborn, works closely with the spirits of the lost kings and queens of Orr to replenish their historic homeland. But there are those who now wonder whether the corruption of Saitan can be cleansed from the Risen. Their bodies, after centuries under the yoke of Saitan's magic, prove difficult to uncorrupt and rebirth. Their memories are too addled, their conscience all but reduced to a singular, violent hunger for flesh. Unlike the Silvari, the Risen had no benevolent guardian watching over them and protecting them from the brunt of the Elder Dragon's will. Some remaining unchained Risen seem hesitant to shrug off the history of the dragon. Some veterans of Zaitan's forces actively sabotage the efforts of those who wish to help them. It becomes clear that if Orr is to be reborn, there are more barriers to overcome than appear on the surface. Ultimately, Orr is a land that has seen turmoil to rival all others. Decimated by a curse, corrupted by an elder dragon, drowned and reborn, all has a way to go before it is fully healed. Watched over by the spirits of its former inhabitants and rulers, modern all may not reach the same heights as in its history, but whatever tomorrow brings, there are strong glimmers of hope for these lands.